Chapter Three of Book One of Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book First, Waterloo. Chapter Three, the eighteenth of June, eighteen fifteen. Let us turn back, that is one of the story tellers' rights, and put ourselves once more in the year eighteen fifteen, and even a little earlier than the epoch when the action narrated in the first part of this book took place. If it had not rained in the night between the seventeenth and the eighteenth of June, eighteen fifteen, the fate of Europe would have been different. A few drops of water, more or less, decided the downfall of Napoleon. All that Providence required in order to make Waterloo the end of Austerlitz was a little more rain, and a cloud traversing the sky out of season sufficed to make a world crumble. The Battle of Waterloo could not be begun until half-past eleven o'clock and that gave Blücher time to come up. Why? Because the ground was wet. The artillery had to wait until it became a little firmer before they could manoeuvre. Napoleon was an artillery officer and felt the effects of this. The foundation of this wonderful captain was the man who, in the report to the directory on Aboukir, said, "'Such a one of our balls killed six men.' All his plans of battle were arranged for projectiles. The key to his victory was to make the artillery converge on one point. He treated the strategy of the hostile general like a citadel, and made a breach in it. He overwhelmed the weak point with grape-shot. He joined and dissolved battles with cannon. There was something of the sharpshooter in his genius. To beat in squares to pulverise regiments, to break lines, to crush and disperse masses, for him everything lay in this, to strike, strike, strike incessantly, and he entrusted this task to the cannonball. A redoubtable method, and one which, united with genius, rendered this gloomy athlete of the pugilism of war invincible for the space of fifteen years. On the 18th of June, 1815, he relied all the more on his artillery, because he had numbers on his side. Wellington had only 159 mouths of fire. Napoleon had 240. Suppose the soil dry, and the artillery capable of moving, the action would have begun at six o'clock in the morning. The battle would have been won and ended at two o'clock three hours before the change of fortune in favour of the Prussians. What amount of blame attaches to Napoleon for the loss of this battle? Is the shipwreck due to the pilot? Was it the evident physical decline of Napoleon that complicated this epoch by an inward diminution of force? Had the twenty years of war worn out the blade as it had worn the scabbard, the soul as well as the body. Did the veteran make himself disastrously felt in the leader? In a word, was this genius, as many historians of note have thought, suffering from an eclipse? Did he go into a frenzy in order to disguise his weakened powers from himself? Did he begin to waver under the delusion of a breath of adventure? Had he become a grave matter in a general unconscious of peril. Is there an age in this class of material great men who may be called the giants of action when genius grows short-sighted? Old age has no hold on the geniuses of the ideal, for the Dantes and the Michelangelos to grow old is to grow in greatness. Is it to grow less for the Hannibals and the Bonapartes? Had Napoleon lost the direct sense of victory? Had he reached the point where he could no longer recognise the reef, could no longer divine the snare, no longer discern the crumbling brink of abysses? 
had he lost his power of scenting out catastrophes. He, who had in former days known all the roads to triumph, and who, from the summit of his chariot of lightning, pointed them out with a sovereign finger, had he now reached that state of sinister amazement, when he could lead his tumultuous legions harnessed to it, to the precipice? Was he seized at the age of forty-six with a supreme madness? Was that titanic charioteer of destiny no longer anything more than an immense daredevil? We do not think so. His plan of battle was, by the confession of all, a masterpiece. To go straight to the centre of the Allies' line, to make a breach in the enemy, to cut them in two, to drive the British half back on Hal and the Prussian half on Tongres, to make two shattered fragments of Wellington and Blücher, to carry Mont Saint Jean, to seize Brussels, to hurl the German into the Rhine and the Englishman into the sea. All this was contained in that battle, according to Napoleon. Afterwards, people would see. Of course. We do not here pretend to furnish a history of the Battle of Waterloo. One of the scenes of the foundation of the story which we are relating is connected with this battle, but this history is not our subject. This history, moreover, has been finished, and finished in a masterly manner, from one point of view by Napoleon, and from another point of view by a whole pliad of historians. As for us, we leave the historians at loggerheads. We are but a distant witness, a passer-by on the plain, a seeker bending over that soil all made of human flesh, taking appearances for realities, perchance. We have no right to oppose, in the name of science, a collection of facts which contain illusions, no doubt. We possess neither military practice nor strategic ability which authorise a system. In our opinion, a chain of accidents dominated the two leaders at Waterloo, and when it becomes a question of destiny, that mysterious culprit, we judge like that ingenious judge, the populace. End of Book First, Chapter Three